Hello and welcome back to Guillotined 18th Century Chemist Theater. Today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite topics in chemistry, and that's precipitation reactions. I just like them. I like them a lot. And so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some very simple solubility rules, and there are definitely better solubility rules than what I'm going to tell you about today out there. And I'll try to put some links in there for that. And we're also going to talk about how to predict the products of a precipitation reaction and see if you have a precipitate based on the solubility rules. Looks like we have a new sidekick here. That's great. Fantastic. Nice to meet you, Willie. Oh, no. Cambot. Cam no. 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 <laughs> um, anyway, and so the idea of a precipitate is, is a pretty common driving force, PPT for short. And so we're dealing with aqueous solutions of ionic compounds. You know, there's a possibility that you might create a product that is insoluble. And so we're going to be able to figure out what those products could be based on what you start with and whether or not those are soluble. And so very straightforward kind of stuff. Um, first thing we're going to do is we're going to list everything in terms of their ionic constituents. I call it an ion pool. So you're going to break everything down into its ions, either the monatomic or polyatomic ions that make things up. And we'll go through a whole example of this, so don't worry. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to swap partners. Um, so you came into the dance with somebody, you're going to leave the dance with somebody else. And we're going to see, okay, well, we know that what we started with was soluble, based on the idea that we always start with two soluble reactants. And the question is, are the new products that could form insoluble? And we'll show you how to do that. And so we'll show you some real simple solubility rules. And if there is no uh, precipitate being formed, then you don't have that driving force. And so the basic solubility rules, and again, now, I, I, I do want to put a disclaimer here. These are extremely... Uh, uh, probably uh, embarrassingly brief solubility rules, sort of like a pocket guide to solubility. And again, I, I will link out to some uh, larger charts. Um, but nonetheless, they're good to get started with. Now, the idea of soluble and insoluble is sort of funny, too. I mean, really, you know, who, who decides at what point something stops being soluble? I mean, you've got this gradient of solubility, so at what point do you call it quits? Sort of like if you have a, a color spectrum going from, you know, blue to red. Uh, at some point, you're going to have to make a call in the middle, you know, well, this is blue and this is red, even though it's going to be really just purple. And so uh, solubility rules, generally, uh, you have a concentration of a certain amount. Now, we haven't talked about moles yet in these lessons, but nonetheless, there's a specific quantitative concentration that if you're above it, you're soluble, and if you're below it, you're insoluble. Um, and that's, that's pretty straightforward. Um, some people uh, even get into the idea of slightly soluble. And again, as Kembot points out, really... The difference between something that's highly uh, insoluble and something that's slightly soluble is, is negligible. It's really sort of a judgment call. Um, and then some chemists even get into the idea of what is slightly soluble and others don't. And so you'll see some solubility charts talking about things being slightly soluble and other ones talking about them being insoluble. It's just the way it is. Again, it's not changing anything that's happening in nature. It's just our definition of soluble. So just get ready for a little bit of frustration there along the way. So. Anyway, my very, very simple pocket guide to solubility rules. Generally speaking, when you see these things in ionic compounds, it's going to be soluble. Uh, you've got your nitrate, nitrite, acetate, perchlorate, per, uh, chlorite, chlorate, group 1 ions, anybody in group 1 in the alkali metals, um, ammonium, polyatomic, and then you've got your chlorides, bromides, iodides, and sulfate. And notice as you go down, you're going to run into more and more exceptions. But really, those first two rows right there, when you see any of that stuff in a compound, either as a cation or an anion, it's probably going to be soluble. And the same thing goes with the insoluble stuff. Uh, there's a lot more exceptions, of course. But when you see silver in a compound, sulfide, uh, fluoride, carbonate, phosphate, chromate, hydroxide, oxide, um, these are generally insoluble. But again, there's a lot of exceptions, often with, surprise, no surprise, uh, group 1 and ammonium. So again, whenever you see something starting with something, a group 1 ion, or ammonium, it's probably going to be soluble. If you see something ending in a nitrate, it's probably going to be soluble. Um, and then you've got some that are slightly soluble, like the hydroxides. Um, so, you know, group 2 hydroxides, some people call them insoluble, and some people call them slightly soluble. Um, again, you know, it, you're going to get used to seeing these as you practice. Um, but but as, as, as general kind of uh, back of the envelope sort of stuff goes, these, these, these rules will get you by most of the time. So feel free to refer back to this throughout this whole lesson, or any of the other charts I'll try to link out. So let's look at a precipitation reaction. Um, so let's mix together uh, potassium chromate and barium nitrate. 
Uh, again, don't worry about balancing until later. Balancing is really not that important at, 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 at this juncture. We're just looking to see the production of products. So determine the formulas. You need to know how to name stuff. If you do not know how to name stuff, go back and learn how to name stuff. Oh, I have a lot of lessons on that. Um, or again, the internet has copious resources about naming. Um, but anyways, so you're going to come up with the names of these compounds. Um, you've got potassium chromate and barium nitrate. Um, and again, uh, charges, all that stuff is available to you to crisscross down. Uh, these are both aqueous that said they were soluble. Step two, write down the ionic components. And again, you, you can certainly write down your ion pool first and then name your compounds. It doesn't really matter what order you do this stuff in. But you've got uh, the potassium ion, the barium ion, chromate, and nitrate ions. Again, and we're not worried about balancing any of this stuff out. And so potassium came to the dance with chromate, barium came to the dance with nitrate, uh, but they're going to get an opportunity to swap partners. Okay, it doesn't really matter which one you swap. Uh, remember, though, that the, you're going to have to go to opposite charge. So potassium isn't going to dance with barium. They have the same charge. And so just find out who the new partners are. Um, so potassium's going to check out nitrate, and barium's going to check out chromate. And uh, again, you know, then you can write the formulas, just crisscross down. Now, a very, very, very common mistake here, a very common mistake, is that people will simply take the subscripts that existed on the left and put them over to the right. Like people will see the potassium had a two subscript on the left, and then they'll put a two subscript on the right. And that's wrong. You have to redetermine the subscripts because it's a new formula. So you've got potassium nitrate and barium chromate. Well, again, potassium nitrate is obviously going to be soluble based on the rules we have. Um, chromates... Uh, can be soluble, but they're insoluble uh, with barium. And so we actually do have a driving force here. We have a reaction. And so what we can do is we can actually write this several different ways. The, the way you're probably most used to seeing it is a molecular equation. Um, just simply writing out the compounds, um, and now we balance them. Um, so I went ahead and balanced it for you there, but you need two potassium nitrates. Again, this is where you're going to start balancing based on the polyatomics that show up on both sides. So don't break these up into oxygens and nitrogens. Look for the nitrates on both sides. You had two on the left, so you obviously need two on the right. And then that two will also take care of the potassium on the left. This is what you'll see most of the time. But in these uh, sort of uh, reactions, we can actually write down what's called a total ionic equation. And what we do is we just take everything that's aqueous and we break it back down in its component ions, leaving it balanced. And so all I did was I took the three aqueous compounds and I broke them down. There were two potassiums, one chromate, one barium, two nitrates, two potassiums, and two nitrates. And notice that everything stays balanced. Um, all we're doing is we're just really writing a more honest assessment of what's going on. Because remember that an aqueous ionic compound breaks apart into its ions. So a chemist who looks at the top sees the second, but we should get used to writing the second one in this. And so that's called a total ionic equation. And then what we can do is we can, cut, we can cross out what are called spectators, the ones that aren't really doing anything. Um, for example, if you can see potassium really doesn't do anything, it just floats around the whole time. And so does nitrate, it just floats around the whole time. So we can go ahead and cross those out and we get what's called a net ionic, so total and net, or some people call it the complete ionic. And so really what we have is barium and chromate forming barium chromate. That's really the reaction that takes place. And so those are three different ways of writing these reactions. You should know how to do all three of these. Um, uh, you're definitely probably gonna have to do these for, for class assessments. Uh, you should be able to, again, write out the balanced molecular equation, which you'll always use even after this unit's done. But in this unit in particular, you should be able to write out a total and a net ionic equation. Again, just teasing everything out as component ions and then uh, looking to see what's left. And so uh, uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll post a lesson where we go through another one of these for practice, but I mean, you can do these for any, any kind of precipitation reaction you have. Anyway, so that's the first of our major driving forces, precipitation reactions. They're a lot of fun. I'll link some uh, videos out to uh, show you some precipitation reactions in action also. And so thanks for watching. Hope you're practicing. And uh, have a great day.